Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, cool. So I'm going to talk about, uh, so this is EDM in English, teaching an old dog new tricks. Um, so in this case, it's te teaching data dog new tricks. I want to talk about our journey uh, since 2010 um, about on, on the road to learn, you know, to discover our customers, discover our products, understand our ecosystem, and eventually really understand ourselves. Um, so there are a few people who know about Datadog. Any, any users in the room? All right, thank you. Thanks for your business. Um, for those who don't uh, know what we do, we are in monitoring and analytics of um, application infrastructure. So it's sort of plumbing. Uh, that's one way to, to talk about it. You know, it's really the idea is to provide real-time visibility into how an app and its underlying infrastructure um, are behaving. Uh, for people like engineers and you know customer web customers like Airbnb and um, Twitter and so on, and it helps them understand what's going on with the app from from inside in the back end mostly. Um, we now have so I can't disclose the exact number, but it's in the public website we say thousands of customers, which is true, um, and we have really tiny customers, um, uh, literally you know. Two people in a garage, and we have really large customers. You know, large. I don't know, Fortune 10, Fortune 5. Um, so really large enterprises. So that's that's been. It's obviously we didn't start like that. So um, that's kind of an interesting. Uh, I thought it'd be something interesting to share. Um, and uh, really, we try to build a platform. Uh, and I'll talk about that. The platform is. I find it a really an overused word. A lot of people say. In the early days, we said, yeah, we have a platform, and we didn't have a platform because it was, it was really very limited. But year after year, I think we tried to build something that, that's a platform. I'll, I'll, I'll spend some time discussing what it is. Okay, so nine years ago, uh, so we, we started officially in 2010. So nine years ago, there, there were actually fewer people than that, and most of them are still, um, still in the company. We're a handful of people. We didn't know um, anything about enterprise, uh, enterprise customers. So we're technically an enterprise software company. So enterprise software, you're thinking going to sell to enterprise customers. And we, didn't have, we really, really didn't have a clue. Um, we didn't have any customers. We, we, I'm going to try to not walk there. Um, we didn't really have any money. I mean, basically using credit cards to, uh, to finance ourselves. And uh, we barely built, started to build a product. Um, so it's been an interesting path from nothing to something. Um, and for me, the, the really interesting bit is, is what we've learned. And, and, and I'll, I'll get into a bit more specific. So um, I want to talk about primarily four things um, over these nine years. I want to talk about customers, because I think this is something that um, we started as a, as a tech company, as you know, techies, and we know how to write code and so on. And quickly, we discovered that we needed to understand um, those people known as customers. Otherwise, there would be no business to be had. So there was a lot of learning, and the con learning continues there. Um, I want to talk about the ecosystem, also what we learned about, because you're, you're a company, but you're not, you're not in a vacuum. So sure, you have customers, but yeah, there's partners. Um, there's a lot of stuff around you. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how stuff around you evolved and how that, um, that, that impacted us. Um, I want to talk our, about our product or our products, how we evolve you know, year over year. And finally, what we learned about ourselves. Um, and so let's start. Uh, the journey starts in 2010, 2013. So I won't necessarily get to, into a lot of details. Um, because it's, these were not the very glamorous years, I'll say that. Um, as, as I think old entrepreneurs um, experience, you go through highs and, you know, highs and lows, um, and you're never, we at least never got a very clear signal that that's it, you know, we, we, we nailed it. Now we, are, we just have to execute and everything is gonna be there. This, when we started in the early days, and even to some extent today, um, what's ahead of us is very much, you know, unknown, ultimately unknown. Um, it's for, for, for us to make it what we want it to be, but we also have to be humble enough to realize that it all doesn't always uh, pan out. 
Um, the maybe one interesting anecdote is uh, 2010. I think it's we went to uh, Mountain View. We applied for Y Combinator, and we we got um, we didn't get in. They it was an interesting experience. It stung. It didn't feel good when somebody tells you, "Yeah, nah." Um, uh, but it, we learned something there, and it was we learned to focus on our sort of on what we were going to sell to customers, what value, what problem we're going to solve for them. Um, so this is a, I'll, I'll, this should explain, I mean, not this, but what I'll tell you about that. This is our web page from 2013, roughly. Um, and at the bottom, so, you know, nice graphics, whatever, it was in fashion in 2013. That, that style's gone now, but um, at the bottom of it, or the first, the lead of the site, you know, that says, this is who we are. Uh, we said, I'll read because I can't memorize it. Data is a service for IT operations and development teams who write and run applications at scale and want to turn the massive amounts of data produced by their apps, tools, and services into actionable insight. Okay, does anybody understand what this means? Okay. Uh, has it ever... Has anybody ever woken up in the morning and say, yes, today I'm going to turn massive amounts of data into actionable insights? <laughs> Not really. So in reality, we were, you know, we were trying to kind of hit all the points, and, but it didn't convey what we were really, um, what, who we were really, because we didn't know. And so part of the journey ultimately is to understand who you are as a company. In particular, there were two things that are missing. Let's see if this works. No, um, no laser. Um, we didn't have monitoring, and when I opened, I said we're a monitoring and analytics company. So monitoring, we thought it was a dirty word. We thought it was a dirty word because back in 2010, um, the, 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 the market of monitoring is one that has a lot of small players, a, a few large players, legacy like HP, IBM, CA, BMC. If, you, if most of the names don't mean anything to you, don't worry. Uh, they, they, should, they don't have to. Um, so really like massive enterprise software that's sold for millions a year and uh, millions of dollars a year that never work. Everybody's pissed about them. It's kind of the, you know, the old school IT. Um, there was a lot of mom and pop, you know, small shops. They'll do monitoring at a small scale. And there was open source. And so we thought, oh my God, if we're going to enter this market, it's going to be a slog. It's going to be tough. There's really, you know, Incumbents are really big, serving a market we cannot address. The enterprise market, and at the bottom, um, you know, on the sort of lower scale, it's going to be a fight against a thousand other companies. So we, we didn't want to be categorized as, as a monitoring company. Um, and then while we started, we didn't have any money. So while we started on the cloud, there's no. I, I never in the description I read before there's the word cloud uh, because in 2013, like cloud wasn't real. So we thought. It, I mean, it could run stuff. You could, you could run, we could run our stuff, but we thought if enterprise, uh, enterprises read cloud in a product that thought it was a tour, because at that point they thought it was a tour, so we didn't want to be associated with it. Um, so that's, that's how you end up with this you know, mumbo jumbo that people, people are like, hey, yeah, I've heard data, I want to try it. They read it, it's like, oh, I'm not sure I understand what it does. Um, so who we really were, and it took us, you know, two and a half years to understand. It effectively, it took us two and a half years to write this sentence. Uh, so data is a service, blah, 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 that wakes you up in the middle of the night when your application is on fire. That's essentially who we are. We wake you up in the middle of the night. Um, we do more than that, but fundamentally, what got people to use us and come back to it is that was a value we delivered to them, is we let them understand what's going on and, you know, kind of not be alerted by the customers that their, um, their stuff is down, but we would tell them, hey, your stuff is down. And by we, I mean the tool we had built. Um, and so I think looking back, getting that sentence was, getting to that realization and you know, eventually writing it down, that was a really important uh, journey. And that's maybe when something clicked. And the way it, it manifested itself, when you effectively building stuff that wake pe other people up, um, when we built that, is people would come back to the product. The, the, before we had that, people would say, "Yeah, cool, I can send a lot of data, I can understand what's going on, but you know, I move on, life, life happens." Once we built something that brought them back in, 
then they then we became part of their daily lives, uh, as I'm sure some of um, some of you who use us um, we're part in a small way of your daily lives, not necessarily the best moments, but we're part nonetheless. Um, so then we, you know, we, we said, okay, cool. So we're SaaS and we do monitoring and we understand cloud really well. You know, that's, that's the, that's the other way to, to think about it. So three years to get there, um, from zero to 10 customers, uh, small or, you know, small month to month, um, a lot of traveling with a lot of events, a lot of demos, you know, going from city to city, mostly in the US, a little bit in Europe, um, schlepping the, the, the displays and the computers and connecting everything and say, oh, well, let me tell you about Datadog and so on. Um, that was the, the early years. And, and finally, we, we got to this. We got to enough clarity that we thought, okay, now I think we can, you know, we can start to scale it a little bit. Um, at that time, so, uh, well, this is a bit of a term of the you know, jargon of the uh, R industry, but um, there's this notion of, so observability is be able to see and understand what's happening inside a computer stack. If you've, if you've ever been into a data center, you know, any application looks like, physically looks like a bunch of blinking lights. That's, that's, that's an app, because that's, that's a bunch of servers connected, they just blink, that's all they do. Or they, they heat up the space and they blink. And so as a, as a, as a person, that's not, you can't, do anything with it, just blinking lights and heat. Uh, you need a tool to sort of tell you, okay, this, you actually, your app is up or, up or down and it's slow here and your CPU is about to burst in flames and you run out of disk space and all that stuff. You need some software to tell you that. And that's, that's us, you know, that, that's another way to think about us. And so one of the pillars of observability is um, the ability to measure things from that, you know, Compute, that pile of computers, that pile of hot computers. Um, and so we built a product which internally we call metrics, and it measures anything. It measures CPU, memory, number of people, uh, clicking on a, you know, on a site, um, and so on and so forth. And, and we let people measure anything. It could be temperature. We have people doing random stuff with like solar panels and so on, but that's, that's a different story. Um, so I'm going to fast forward to 2014, um, and I want to talk about that year in three different categories, which I sort of alluded um, earlier. Uh, I want to talk about customers, ecosystem, and ourselves, kind of what we, how, the kind of changes that are, that are happening. So in 2014, um, we, uh, we went, like a few years prior, to AWS reInvent. So I'm assuming AWS is a, is a fairly common provider. Um, and reInvent is sort of the big event in Las Vegas, uh, kind of interesting in, in it's, it's where everybody, everybody, this is like the biggest cloud event, if you will, of, of the entire industry. Um, and so in 2014, you remember I told you that we didn't want to use uh, cloud in our description initially because we thought cloud was, a, was not real, it was a toy. And so interestingly, in 2014, we see Enter enterprise users show up at, at reInvent, which means they're curious, which means, um, you know, there's something, it's not maybe they won't use it right away, but they, there's this notion that maybe that's where the future is. They want to they understand. Um, we have our first booth, it's really small. Um, and among those enterprise customers, we don't see any banks. And that's kind of, eh, okay, maybe, maybe the large manufacturers are showing up, maybe, I remember meeting with, I think, uh, like Weather Channel, you know, so large media sites, online media sites. Um, so it was promising, uh, but no banks. It was like, uh, you know, it's not clear that the cloud's gonna take off because the banks are not there. And there's this, they're, you know, they have a significant firepower in enterprise. Um, so that's, that's uh, after the show, that's, you know, what, what we will learn. Uh, in terms of ecosystem, interestingly enough, that's when the this Docker hit 1.0. And, and that year in 2014, I, I gave a session, I reinvent like a monitoring session, which was, uh, so monitoring uh, Docker containers. It was immediately sold out. Like they had, a, and it's not like I had something very interesting or very groundbreaking to talk about. It was like, okay, well, containers is this, this is how you monitor containers. It's kind of very basic. There was a line, and I'm not a particularly good speaker, so you know, it's not like I don't do magic tricks or anything like that, so, but there's a line around you know, to get in. And so this was an interesting, an interesting learning uh, data point for us. Um, and we saw, um, we saw that 
people really wanted, you know, they started to connect their tools to us, they started to send lots of data. We saw that how we integrate in a customer's environment was really important. Um, uh, and in particular, uh, when it comes to APM. So APM is application performance monitoring, is sort of looking at, at the health of an application in a very particular way. And um, that, that's something that we saw resonate with, with customers. And so um, the learning we had is, first of all, we need to understand uh, Docker. We need to understand Docker because we need to, understand, to really get it because people are excited about it. Now, in 2014, it wasn't clear whether it was, a, um, it was real, it was just a buzzword, you know, it could be a fad that comes and goes. Uh, but we had to make the bet. So we say, okay, well, let's, let's invest, let's spend time, let's time and energy and, uh, you know, essentially money, um, making sure that we can understand as a monitoring company, we can monitor containerized environments really, really well. Um, we, uh, we knew that we had to do a lot of, um, you know, uh, cloud to integrate really well with cloud, which means um, because the enterprise users starting to show up. So the thinking was, if they show up, they're interested, which means they're going to try it. If they're going to try it, they may, we're well positioned because we were born in the cloud um, to help them understand what's going on in the cloud. So we should continue to invest there and we've never stopped since. Um, it's been particularly good for us. Um, we should explore APM. So APM is this particular way of looking at application perform uh, of application health. Uh, we we that's not what we were doing at that time, but we saw that a lot of our you know we didn't have a lot of customers, but a lot of our customers then had an APM tool. And so this is like this is a pattern that we see time and again. And you know you sell something to, to you know you, you build enterprise software, you sell some things, so you have a user. Kind of immediate question to ask is what else are they using? Because that's, you know, what, what else is not they as in uh, hypothetical they, but your user in the, com in the, in, you know, in the company, what, what else are they, that person? What else are they using? You know, what other problem are they solving? So, uh, and then of those connected things, what makes sense? You know, like you could say, yes, uh, my user is using Slack. Okay, well, so are a lot of the people. Now, for us, would it make sense to, to think, Maybe we should think of building a chat product. You know, probably not. We're not in we're not in that communication collaboration space, so it's it's different. In our case, we saw APM like New Relic is one of the you know established players in in, in the space. Well, everybody who's using Datadog uses New Relic, so that tells us something. That tells us that well, first of all, we're complementary to New Relic, which means we're not you know a tool like New Relic, which means. Um, they, they think they, a customer thinks they need us and them to, um, you know, to get answers. And so that gave us some idea. Um, and then the other thing we learned is that, and this is more a go-to market thing, is um, enterprises, uh, and the way they were adopting cloud is they were sending engineers, so, you know, I don't know, uh, not IBM because that's kind of their play, but... Um, uh, listen, Nestle, to, to take an example, uh, they would send you know engineers like software engineers, and so what to AWS, and so this is a different. If you, if you think about how large companies buy technology, there's kind of two ways. Either an engineer goes and try it, tries it out and say, okay, that's cool, you know, we should use that, and they figure out a way to get adopted and and you know budget it and so on. Or you go and wine and dine, play golf with the CIO, and then the CIO says, okay, yes, I decided our strategy is going to be this. We're going to buy this tool. We're going to spend $100 million. So you have sort of top-down, um, uh, kind of outbound field sales. We're going to meet the, you know, the top of the, the food chain and convince them that they should buy your stuff at scale. Or, and that was relatively new, you have the bottom-up um, approach, which is you're going to convince uh, users one by one, even inside large enterprises, that they should adopt your stuff. And that's, that's something that didn't exist before. Kind of open source, opened the way there, where there was sort of a little bit of a uh, guerrilla adoption. And then cloud, interestingly, uh, followed the same path. Um, AWS, because, pe pe because the people at the top considered cloud as a toy, um, AWS didn't start as, yeah, we signed you know, a five, uh, you know, $5 billion uh, contract with Snap or something like that. They started with somebody in the trenches, got a, you know, the, the department credit card, 
put it in and started to run shadow IT. You know, they started to run their own stuff. They didn't tell the IT, the centralized IT department uh, that they were using AWS. And that's how they got started. And then the developers were like, wow, that's cool. I don't have to wait for six months to get, or 12 months to get a piece of metal to run myself. I can get it right away. Let's do more of that. And they got to a point where um, companies realize, oh, you know, what's going on? We have, you know, all these, all these credit cards charges from AWS. What's this AWS thing? And that's how they, you know, they effectively got, um, they, they got hooked. Uh, and so we followed, a, you know, somewhat the same, uh, the same path. Um, our, even to this day, you can try our product for free you can, like, without talking to anybody. Like literally, you don't have to enter. Well, yes, you have to enter your name and email, but it's just so that you can log in. We don't ask you to, nobody's going to call you right away. They wait a little bit. Um, and, uh, and then no, it's not a stripped down version. It's not a demo account. It's not like some you know, toy. Uh, it's the real thing. So you can try. Like, that's the best thing um, you know, for us. Um, so at, uh, at that time, we still have only one product. We keep building it, and you know, it's our workhorse and so on, but we only have one. Um, fast forward 2015. So in 2015, this is, from a customer standpoint, um, there's an interesting thing that happens. There's a bank, there's a retail bank in, uh, in the U.S. called Capital One. Uh, it's probably equivalent of, I don't know, uh, they don't have a big investment bank, so I don't know, Credit Agricole maybe or something like that. So, you know, pick a retail bank. Um, and they, they, they are on stage at, at reInvent where they realize to say, yes, we're all, you know, all in the cloud. Uh, and this is like, wow, this is, this, this is a significant shift in the, in, in the mindset because now the banks, which in the 80s, 90s, early aughts were at the forefront of technology, had an adopted cloud and they were falling behind. And it was just one bank that said, okay, no, we, are, we believe in cloud. And, and the banks are heavily regulated, not the most regulated industries, but heavily regulated. So it, it's essentially the effect it has, it, it tells other people in, um, in the industry, cloud is okay. And even for, because if you're not, you don't want to be the, for, if you're a large enterprise, you know, CIO and so on, or you don't want to be the first to say, yes, we adopted cloud and it failed and I'm going to get fired because that's usually what happens. Um, it's a lot easier if somebody says, somebody, you can point at, look, you know, we're, we're X and they do it, so we should do it you know, because they do it. Now it's, you know, they, you, you can have good reasons to do it, uh, but it, it sort of validates the choice um, that you're making. So. For us, what that means is that's now serious business. We, people do not equate cloud to just, oh, it's a toy, it's gonna go away. It's getting real. Um, so of course, you know, it'll have implication on our positioning, um, our go-to-market and so on. Um, in terms of ecosystem, and this is, um, we have, so there's something called Kubernetes, abbreviated as Kate's here, um, which is, sits on top of Docker, it orchestrates Docker containers. It reaches 1.0 um, and um, it's really the orchestrator is the it's it's what makes or breaks your containerized environment. If it's you need, there are so many containers all over the place. When you when you containerize your application, there's so many of them. There's so much firmware all that. Unless you have a piece of unless you have the piece of code that keeps that, you know, up and running and schedules the schedules, start stops, then just you can't operate. Um, and so at that point, we see that come up. So oh, Kubernetes comes comes out of Google. So they have good creds uh, for the, you know, based on that. Um, and it's not, there are other competing ones, but we feel like, yeah, maybe they're the ones that are gonna, they're gonna um, maybe they're gonna pick up, we, we don't know, so we start investing there. So again, kind of observing what the ecosystem looks like and figuring out whether, whether we should understand this piece. Because remember, we're about monitoring. Monitoring is about observing. So you need to understand what you're observing. So in this case, if a customer has a Kubernetes environment and you plug in Datadog, we need to tell you something interesting out of it. Otherwise, we're not doing our job. Um, the other piece that was interesting is Lambda is announced. Um, it's actually a small, it's not a reinvent, it's a small. The Lambda is like serverless and you, just, you execute a piece of code without any servers as it were. Uh, well, at least you don't have access to the servers. Um, it's like a you know blog post at the end of the year, kind of after Thanksgiving, but uh, it's interesting because it's a kind of a new way to think about running applications. Um, and then for ourselves, what we discover, well, what we decided is like you know this APM thing with that all our customers use an APM as well. Well, why don't we try? Why don't we try to make one? Because 
look, if if a uh, customer is spending 100 bucks with us, 100 bucks with New Relic, then they could also spend 200 bucks with us and zero with New Relic. And that's better for us. I mean, that's bad for New Relic, but, you know, so be it. Um, so what we learn, you know, enterprise, uh, cloud adoption bottom up, you know, I, I talked about that. So the, the, the you know, term of, um, of the art is like land and expand. So you sort of, you, you put your foot in the door because you have, you convince a group of people in a large company to adopt you, and then you try to sell around. You know, it's just they talk to you. you, you help them evangelize their use inside the company. So you, you, know, you help, you tell them, you provide them training, you make them happy, you make them the hero um, of the day, thanks to us, but we don't want to be thanked. They have to be thanked. Um, you know, so for you, so hopefully we made you heroes one day. Um, if we haven't, let me know. And, uh, that's good feedback. Um, the the other thing we um, we we started to gather too is that look, the environment is getting more and more complex. There's all this stuff that comes you know comes up Kubernetes, Lambda, Docker, and so on. It's hard to keep up. So actually, uh, everybody wants to learn, but and it's a lot easier. Um, if we can give people some some introduction to new technologies, um, it, it'll be good for us because it'll create, you know, repeat visits to our blog, for instance. And it'll be good for them, for you know, for for everyone because they'll learn, and then you provide pointers. So, um, DigitalOcean, I think, is the one that really popularized that. Um, is um, kind of create a lot of content as a, as a as a lead strategy. Um, like good quality content, not hey buy data dog da 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 da. Hey buy data dog da da da. You know, not not a not a sell a sales pitch every three lines, but rather here's some good info that solves your problem, and then the, the bottom. By the way, you know we're so and so. That's what we do, and that's very uh, very powerful um, strategy to gain uh, to gain leads. You know, in other words. Um, containers drive complexity, so this is, um, you know, the, it's just, it's an evolu technical evolution, technology, it's a te technological evolution that's, that's changing the way um, we think of applications, and it, it was, it, it happened really fast, you know, 2014 Docker is 1.0, 2015 Kubernetes is 1.0, and people started to invest a lot of mindset, you know, a lot of time thinking about it, so. Um, we thought we got to invest time, you know, we got to invest people's time in there and just develop a big, um, a, a, you know, a lot of integrations. But also, when you think about, uh, you know, in the, in, the er in the early days, when I started my career, data centers were, or applications were static, you know, there's a front end, middleware database, and that's it, the app server middleware database never changes every, you know, every year you add machines because that's how fast you can add machines. Um, now we're talking about things, containers that come and go, you know, every, let's say, minute. Uh, and that's, that means just the sheer complexity of things changing in the environment is, is starts to become, to exceed what a person can understand. Things just, there are too many of them and change too fast. And so um, what that taught us is we're going to have to invest in machine learning. And... Um, and machine learning is, look, it can, can mean a ton of things. Um, machine learning, the way we think about it is, how do we reduce complexity of that environment? How do we tell you the important things, the patterns, the things that keep happening, or the things that never happened and now started to happen? Um, there's a bunch of techniques for that. Some of them are true machine learning. Some of them are statistical processing. Um, it actually doesn't matter that much. It's what mattered for us is to realize that, hey, we need to tackle that complexity. We're not just going to reproduce the complex environment in front of your eyes and a bunch of things in the screen. We need to cut, cut through that. Like reduce, 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 simplify, simplify, simplify. So otherwise you're going to get lost. And then that's, we're not doing our job. Um, and the other thing we learned, and that we learned by doing, creating the SAPM product from scratch, it's really hard. Um, and kind of when you're a startup, you create a product. Usually, if you're a product, you know, centric startup, you create something, and it's hard. It's not hard for, but it's not the same hard. It's really hard because when you start, you have nothing, and you're creating something out of nothing, and you don't know who you are, who your customers are, what your product is. When you start to have some some momentum there, creating a second product is really hard because not only you don't know what you're doing, but also you're um, 
you have to battle, you have a, a problem of focus. You know, how much should I spend on, how many people should work on this new product? And if they work on this new product, not doing all this great stuff for the existing product. So um, even to this day, or, or even as years pass, it's, it's harder and harder. And it's why um, I think large companies just don't innovate, just too hard. Just the, 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 the inertia, the weight of the existing is such that um, it's really difficult for people to, 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 to keep innovating. But, you know, so as part of our kind of, you know, mo uh, modus operandi, if you will, uh, our way of being, we said we'll try to create a product every year, you know, more or less. I mean, that's, that's and we'll say, well, we, we got to do it. Otherwise, we'll just revert to inertia will bring us back to just let us keep doing what we know how to do. And, and that's it. Um, so at that point, we have the second pillar of visibility, so it's just kind of another, you know, we had metrics initially, which you can measure anything, and now we have traces, which is effectively APM. So we, we're starting to see the very beginning of a platform, and a platform is, um, it's, not a, it's not a group of products that are in the same screen, that's not a platform. A platform is, um, it's... The products are have to be so intertwined and so interwoven and and kind of that it's when you use both you feel like it's more valuable that if you use one or and the other separately it's really difficult to to um, to achieve uh, uh, I think when when we when we build those two for instance uh, one of the things we struggle with is how do you go, like literally, how do you go from one screen of one to the other? Like, what are the path? How do you connect things? Um, and if you're able to create these bridges in, the, in each product so that you can bounce back as needed, then you start to have a platform. There's more to a platform to it, but that's kind of step zero. Um, 2016. So, uh, more cloud, more containers. Uh, that's, you know, in, in a summary. So, uh, AWS signs bigger and bigger deals. We sign bigger and bigger deals. Um, the, at least in the U.S., you know, I think um, Europe and Asia was starting to, we could see it picking up a little bit. In the U.S., things start to really um, ramp up, and so we had. Um, we also had. We could see AWS was not the only game in town. Um, now Microsoft with Azure really started to invest. Google with Google Cloud was was aware that there was something they should do. They just didn't know how to do it, or they built some amazing technology, just didn't know how to sell it. But nonetheless, they were trying. Um, so the the customers that what that meant is it was a full embrace of the cloud. Um, maybe some euphoria, I don't know, but but really thinking, okay, that's that's where we gotta go. That's that's where. Um, Things are next, and back in I think 20, you know, 2014, First Bank says, "Hey, we're on cloud." 2014, the CEO of one of the largest U.S. banks says, "You know, no cloud. It's over my dead body. We go to the cloud um, because they were too scared of data leaks and you know, stuff like that." And 2016 is I think when that guy says, "You know what? We're gonna go to the cloud," and and that's that's a very powerful moment. Uh, because it means a lot of people are, are, are watching and they're going to wonder, well, why is he saying they should go to the cloud? What did they see? What did this guy and his team see in the cloud that we're not seeing? And that gets a lot of people thinking, maybe we should go. And then they you know, kind of rationalize the decision. Um, in the ecosystem, uh, Kubernetes um, you know, kind of won the orchestrator wars, um, which means that while it was very young and aspirational, our bet on investing and understanding Kubernetes so that we can monitor it on behalf of our customers was trying to pay off, or was going to pay off, because it was, we bet on the right horse. Now, in truth, we also bet on the other horses. Uh, they lost, and we just pull back and say, okay, the team that was working on, there was an, another one called Mesos, they said, okay, then just don't work on it. Just leave it as is. And you know, we'll, we'll patch our support of Mesos once in a while, but uh, we're not going to actively support it because it's not going to be actively developed uh, in a while. Uh, in 2016, uh, uh, serverless was born. Um, so now I'm, I don't know how many people know about serverless. I've heard the word serverless. So again, this notion that uh, you don't need machines to run code. So it's not true. You do need machines. Uh, but that that's all delegated to the customer, to the to the cloud provider. Interestingly, Google in 20, 2008, maybe seven eight, 
introduced Google App Engine, which was kind of that, uh, but it just didn't take, uh, it didn't really take. Uh, Snap, Snapchat was built on Google App Engine, but there were very few examples of uh, successful large-scale companies built on that. But somehow in 2016, serverless catches on. And I, I have no idea why. No, I don't know why in 2016 it resonated and why not in 2010 and so, but it's just, you, uh, the, you have to be sort of on the lookout. You have to, I think, try to understand what's happening around, around you. Um, and again, for ourselves, you know, we had started to build that APM product and uh, on top, you know, in addition to the metrics product. And we always think, okay, what's next? You know, we got to keep building, but what's next? And we thought about logs. Logs is, um, uh, you know, sort of, well, logs are everywhere. You know, applications log a lot of stuff to files. Uh, everybody has, a, again, same observation. Oh, okay, now we sell two products, but everybody we talk to has a log management, Splunk or whatever, Sumo Logic or something. Um, and so, same question, same, we keep the same person, we'll look at what are the tools that they're using every day? What are the questions are they asking? Essentially asking them, themselves, what answers do they need? And can we provide these answers? Uh, and if so, then, you know, is it worth, I mean, then it's kind of more of a, a product discussion of can we provide it, how, what price and so on, but this is how, how we think, um, about expanding. And then, uh, again, the importance of the platform is gonna be um, that our logs offering has to mean more when used with the others than um, using just you know, three things next to each other. Um, so, you know, enterprise 2016, I think, was when we started our enterprise sales. So, Enterprise sales uh, is an activity where you eat a lot of steak. Um, I'll say that. So enterprise sales is you go, you, it's, it's outbound. You know, you, you get a, a, I don't know, any enterprise sales people in the, in the audience? Okay, well, I don't know, maybe you don't eat steak. But I, I know each time I, I go on this trip with our sales people, they have me eat steak. So, um, um, so it's really... Um, and you know, maybe you'll correct me and say, ah, it's bullshit, you don't understand enterprise sales, but fundamentally, you, you have, at least the way we do it is we give people a list of accounts and say, okay, you gotta you get us business in these big accounts. And then, so you have to go there, I mean, go or talk to people um, and do meetings, understand, map out the environment, understand the, the, um, the, the environment and, and so on, and close the sale. Um, and now it helps, of course, what's helpful, really helpful is when you have a bottom-up or land and expand approach where individual users can try your product and adopt it without requiring the whole sign-on uh, from the enterprise, enterprise, the entire enterprise. Uh, inside enterprise sales can help and then they, it's sort of a two-pronged thing. You know, the, the individual engineers adopt the product and they have small adoption. Enterprise sales can come in and say, hey, we know you use us. Um, how about we think about, you know, rationalizing data dog adoption across the entire enterprise, for instance. That, you know, that's one approach. Those are cold calling and, you know, discovering new, you know, new accounts. Um, and then we sell inside globally, which means the, the inside sales that we've done so far, which, which really means somebody comes, it's inside inbound, largely somebody comes to our website, somehow they discover us, they try, and during the trial, we pick, the, pick up the phone and say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, would you want to become a customer? And so that's the inside motion. So again, inside, inbound, you know, field, outbound, I mean, you can mix and match, but usually it's, 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 um, it's, it's how it works. And then what we start to do is to do it globally. So because the thing about the cloud too is, um, it, it'll be true the, in 2017, I'll talk about it, but it's really, it's a global phenomenon. We have adoption around the world and we have customers around the world. And so at some point we used to have sales out of Boston in uh, North America, they would sell around the world. Now the problem with that is if you want to pick up the phone, if an Australian prospect tries your product and you want to reach them, that means you're going to stay up pretty late because you know, it's going to be middle of the night. And so that, that's limiting. Um, so that's why we start to sell globally, which means to install inside sales teams uh, you know, around around the world, starting in Europe, and then um, adding, adding some in, in Asia. Um, 
So serverless is a new Docker, which means it's a bet we're making. It's not, it's not Docker, but it's, it's the, the excitement, the buzz is the same. And so again, you know, we sort of pattern match. Is there something, it's worth the investment for us. And so, you know, we do it. We start investing a lot. Um, in terms of APM, what we learned when we added the second product is integration was really an important part of it. And this is sort of somewhat specific to what the product does and how it's usually deployed. But it, it, it was, a, it was a, a, um, a friction factor for us. So we had to work on a lot of that. And then what we learned too is every, everybody uses logs, everybody needs logs. So if you, everybody, everybody uses something and you're close to it, you're, you know, you're not very different from it, for, or what you offer is not very different. That's something, a clue that, hey, maybe we should consider offering it, because, hey, why not get the revenue instead of someone else? Um, so we still have two products and we're effectively working on logs. 2017, um, so now we see XU, outside of the US, um, cloud adoption starting to really pick up. So by at least my estimates back then, uh, say about two years behind in terms of ad adoption. Um, and, but global enterprises, which means like large you know, global companies migrate to the cloud. And so it's not, um, which means that We'll see, and this is maybe why um, what's driven to some extent global cloud adoption is global companies that adopted it. But it means that now we're gonna f we're gonna find customers outside of the U.S. We were very U.S. centric initially, and by the way, we're f founding in New York because that, that I've lived there. For, my co-founder have lived there for 20 years, um, but uh, that's that's promising because that means there's a market outside of the U.S. And you know, luckily, the world is not only the U.S. Uh, in terms of ecosystem, um, there's still, while Kubernetes is an exciting um, uh, open source project, there's still a lot of competing solutions uh, f from, um, from cloud providers, you know, managed, I'm going to speak a bit of jargon there, ECS, Fargate, and so on. Um, so we don't know whether Kubernetes is going to win, and actually, in, in the end, it won. And about ourselves, um, what we start to see is, um, look, if we start offering logs and APM and metrics, and you could see everything you need to see in one application, um, is this what people are looking for? And um, so you ask people, you say, hey, is this, this vision, is it useful? Like, does it, does it resonate? Um, do you want it, essentially? Or, and as what we discover very early on is, um, particularly if you're not trying to sell, if you're just trying to genuinely ask the question, what do you think of this idea? Um, then people are willing to engage. And they told us, yeah, look, I've, to do the stuff you're doing because of the legacy and all that stuff, and we've been, we're a company that, you know, we, the, the, the customer that we're talking to, they say, hey, we know we've been around for 50 years and I have 50 tools that do something like you. Um, and I'm tired of it, so I want to consolidate. And so that's both a threat, because there are 50 tools, and behind these 50 tools, there, there's a company that's fighting for its life. It's also an opportunity, because you're, that means there's pain there. There's somebody telling you, I'm tired of this. It's painful, I want it over with. Um, and so that really has us think hard about our, our platform approach, uh, which is um, really, um, no, not this, but which is really um, deliver something such that the sum of the parts is greater, no, sorry, the, the sum of the whole, the value of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So that's, that's what I consider to be ultimately a platform. It's something where when you use everything at once, um, it's much more valuable than if you use every single thing independently. Um, so things we learn. In 2017, too, is replicating the sales model around the world is tough. It takes time and money. And that's, yes, it was predictable, but nonetheless, um, uh, it was a learning uh, that wasn't completely obvious. Uh, but it's obvious in hindsight, but not, not when you face it. Um, APM became generally available, you know, reached a certain level of maturity. Um, we, so now we really understood which of all the technologies in APM we need to support, which ones made made the most sense, Java and .NET. Um, log management, so we looked, when we, when we thought about starting a log management activity product, we looked around who's doing what, what's, what's available. Mm -hmm. While doing that, we ended up, so we looked at a lot of companies in the space, 
Um, and we discovered that it's a tricky problem for, it's a tricky gross margin problem uh, because it's, it's easy to end up basically reselling storage at a slight margin, um, you know, with a slight margin, so not good. Um, but we found a couple of companies that, that seem to have to be promising. And one of them was the Paris-based company called Logmatic, which we bought uh, that year, because you said, and this is a slight diff, you know, we took a different tack. Instead of saying, well, we're gonna build it ourselves, we thought, can we buy a company and start with what they have, like jumpstart? Because as years pass, as the company gets bigger, it's harder and harder for us to, to start new products. So that's, that's where we did. Now, to this day, we sometimes buy, acquire companies for their, the team, the product, the know-how, and so on. Sometimes we build it ourselves. It, every, all the options are on the table. Um, and, uh, and finally, one note is, um, is that we decided to dog food Kubernetes. And so, you know, Kubernetes is a containerized thing. We, didn't, we supported it for our customers, we didn't use it ourselves. So when you start to use, when you start to dog food your product, um, you see how bad um, things can be. Like it, it's it's a good experience. Um, so if you know in your position, we are lucky enough that we can dog food our own stuff. So if if you can use it, it's great. Um, so at that point, we have three you know three pillars. We can do logs. We can ingest traces. We can you know re just receive and process metrics. Twenty eighteen last year, um, it's sort of. Things start to, um, so the, the, uh, the, the technology st stack is now start to solidify around cloud containers and serverless. Uh, and um, it's sort of how people think about their future applications. They're, okay, cloud is, not, is real, it's not a toy, okay, got it. Uh, it's containerized, I'm not gonna build like a monolithic non-containerized application and I can use serverless and I can do real stuff with serverless. Uh, and so, um, that for us, because we need to provide visibility and observability of our customers' application, means we need to support that that you know that stuff really well. Um, last year, I think public clouds. That's it. You know, the, it's no question that it's it's a toy or a fad or something like that. It's it's now everybody has a class strategy, part of the digital transformation. You know, all these kind of buzzy words, but. Um, when you say, hey, I'm not going to build on the cloud, people look at you and say, why? You know, and so in five, whatever, five years, it's turned completely um, around, and that's, that's a very powerful signal. Um, in the ecosystem, Kubernetes has won the orchestrator war, uh, and serverless is, is here to stay, uh, and I think this is something that is, um, uh, it needs a few iterations. I think maybe not you know, maybe maybe 2023 is it really picks up for real, or 2028? I, I don't know, but like the idea, it's um, the idea is in people's mind that hey, I can write my application logic in small pieces and send and load that up, and that I don't need to run servers anymore. In some cases, in a lot of cases, it's not true. It it can't it can't work, but there's this idea that we can get there, and it'll take a few you know a few iterations, but the industry may get there. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not just some random, you know, random experiment. Um, and so, you know, I talk at length about a platform. We really, um, we really uh, sort of spend. That's that's something that we 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 invest a lot of time in. Um, in last year, and you know, we continue. Um, now, an interesting piece that, that what we learned is globally, try before you buy works for inter, even for enterprise sales, and that's sort of the powerful thing. So now, when I go, when I want to check, you know, some enterprise software, uh, you know, B two B software, if I go to the site, I can't try, I'm, I'm frustrated because uh, I there, there's so many sites where you go to the site, there, you know, so many companies that built and if you if you do it right now, I'm telling you, it's not a good idea, but um, so you can um, go back and change it, but you go to the website, you try to understand what they do, and so there's a you know high level vision statement which may or may not resonate. Ours didn't resonate back then, but you know whatever. And then there's a little cute animation of people running or things moving, and then that's it. And then there's a try, and then you enter, you click, and then oh, I got to fill up my you know fill out the form, and somebody will call me or somebody will send me a PDF. 
And um, that was okay in you know, 2005. That's how people bought software, uh, B2B software. Uh, but it's not okay now. I, I don't think that's, that's fine. Because people want to see, engineers want to see particularly, um, they want to see the product in action. They want to see it like, and so like even the screenshot of the real product is a huge improvement. Because you can you look at it and say, okay, now I get it. I, I kind of get what, it, what it's trying to do. And then the ability to try before you buy is essential. And minimum friction. Um, that's, and it works for enterprise, for large enterprises. That's, that's in a sense how what's fundamentally transformed in the way people buy technology now is they're not, you're not going to go uh, in a long cycle before you can test it or you're not going to tolerate long implementation cycles. You want to, you want to, I want it now, I want it all. And that's still, that also applies to, to, to enterprise. So the reason for that is they, you know, when you get your a, a prospect's attention, like you get 30, kind of the way I think about it, somebody hears about Datadog, they go to the website. So now we have five seconds, you know, a few seconds to keep them interested. And they, they're going to click, okay, what does it do? Okay, I kind of get a sense. Let me go to the pricing page. How much does it cost? Okay, fine. Now let me try it. And then, you know, they enter the, whatever, my name, log in, okay, they can log in, some instruction, landing page instruction, and then we have like five, 15 minutes, 30 minutes of their attention, that's it. And if we, if we can't deliver something there and then, that's over. Not because they, they don't like what we do, but just because they have a million other things to do in their, in their days. I mean, you have, I have, I, I mean, I get bombarded by, by things to try. Um, and so that's really, even in the the cases where you could think that it's going to take, you know, long, a lot of handshake, you know, handshakes and meetings to demo and so on. That's great. You need that still. But if you, if you don't have this easy try before you buy, you start at a disadvantage. And that's, that was a big lesson for me. Um, and starting new products is always hard. So, you know, I talked about, um, about uh, start organically growing or, or acquiring. So now we have a fourth pillar, and we're basically, this year we'll add a fifth one, and so we'll all have to rearrange the slide, but um, that's, our, that's our path. Um, so what hasn't changed in nine years? Um, we're, so I tell the team we build the product, you build, because I don't really build any, I don't shit these days, but um, you build a product, or we, you know, we build a product, but we sell a service. Like we're a subscription service. Um, we're not, the product is there to serve a need. It serves a person and serve a need of a person. So um, we still need to focus about the customer. And we have to focus on the time to value. And time to value is kind of how fast you have to, how much effort and how much time does it take for a customer to get something valuable out of the product. When they start, first start to discover us, also when they're experienced and uh, they've been with us for a while. And we still, I'm still learning. I mean, personally, everybody in the company is still learning, even after nine years. Different problems, different challenges, but always learning. Thank you.